Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is October 16th, 2018, and my guest is Julia Belouz, the senior health correspondent at Vox.com where she focuses on medicine, science, and public health. She holds a master's degree from the London School of Economics. Julia, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Our topic for today is epidemiology. And if we get to it, I hope we can talk also about metabolism and diet, two concepts and issues you've written uh, a lot about, especially recently. Uh, According to the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, epidemiology is, quote, the study of health in populations to understand the causes and patterns of health and illness, close quote. We're going to be looking at a number of articles you've written on epidemiology, the challenges of actually figuring out the truth about these issues, which is quite hard, as listeners know from uh, our past conversations. I want to start with an article you wrote about a recent study in Lancet that argued that the safest level of drinking, and this is talking about alcohol, is none, zero. Um, do you agree with that that conclusion? I don't. And interestingly, the study didn't even show that. So, so it was kind of an, an easy one to, <laughs> to pick apart. Um, yeah, so th- these researchers were looking at uh, many, many studies. I think it was something like seven or 800 um, research papers on the health effects of, of um, alcohol. And they found, and they, they had like a really nice graph where they um, co- collated, I guess, the findings of all these studies to to show you where your risk of death starts to increase um, based on the number of drinks you're consuming each day. And that risk looks like it only goes up after one drink a day um, or even one and a half drinks a day. And yet they came to this really striking conclusion, which is which was that the only um, safe level of alcohol consumption is no alcohol at all. So um, as you can imagine, that upset a lot of people who were um, reading about that. And um, others were upset because we know that there are really strong and terrible health effects from drinking too much alcohol. And they kind of missed the opportunity to have a more nuanced message about that and went for this zero drinks. Um, Yeah, went for the guttural, like no drinks at all. So So I looked at that chart, which you uh, reproduced in your article, and we should mention for listeners that Lancet's one of the premier medical journals in the world, top three probably. Um, that chart, it, it, it's flat at zero in terms of extra risk between zero and one. And then at one, it doesn't like jump up. Uh, it just slowly starts to climb, which right. of course means who knows what, because it's referring to all kinds of different kinds of risk uh, that are probably very complicated, could depend on the kind of alcohol you consume. I assume the number of drinks is some constant, some metric like an ounce or something, because, you know, I have a friend whose joke is that he only had one beer. I say, how big was it? It was 48 ounces. So, you know, what's the, I assume it meant an ounce of some standardized measure. Standard drink, yeah, that's right. I don't, I think it's a little more than an ounce. Um, Yeah, it's not much of a drink, I guess. Uh, yeah. But but the idea is that it, it does move up slowly. It doesn't jump dramatically at any point, right? Absolutely. Yep, Th- that's right. And I think one one thing, we are, if we're talking about epidemiology, I guess what's really important to know about these types of observational studies are that they're just looking at phenomena in a population. So you're looking at... Um, you know what? 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 How? How do people who already drink alcohol and who have been drinking alcohol look different from people who don't drink at all? Or how do heavy drinkers look different from really light drinkers? And what we know is that these groups of people are so different, right? So um, people who drink no no alcohol at all might might be less likely to smoke or might have other um, really healthy lifestyle behaviors or might live in you know, different communities from um, people who are heavier drinkers. And 
Um, so yeah, you have, so yeah, you, you know all about confounding factors and how these other attributes make it really hard to tease out what the actual effect of the drinking was um, in and of itself. And so th these studies are only supposed to be hypothesis generating. So they're supposed to kind of be the start of a conversation about, um, you know, what, you know, this are the start of, a, I guess, research, a line of research into into um, what what might be like, what does healthy moderate drinking actually look like? And you'd want to run um, experimental studies to really tease out um, cause and effect there. But of course, yeah, when when it comes to anything um, that has to do with what we drink and what we eat, it's just, yeah, it takes a long time for these nutrition related deficiencies and diseases to show up. And th there's all kinds of challenges with them. But I guess the main point is that in the media, we often talk about these observational studies like they do have causal conclusions. And in this case, even the researchers did in their own conclusion. But um, if this is an example where, you know, they, they, they can talk about associations between things, but not that one thing caused the other, if right, that makes the, sense. Yeah, no, exactly, because I think that, you know, that's the most important point for people to remember. We talk about a lot here, but I think it's easy to forget that what we're really interested in is what would happen if you took one more drink and what would happen to the average, the correlation between in a population of people who drink a little bit more than everyone else does not necessarily and may be grossly inaccurate for telling you what would happen if you had one more drink or if everyone chose to have one more drink. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, um, it's misleading. Yeah. And it's pr probably important to be clear, like that, that again, I think no one quibbles about the fact that heavy drinking is associated with all kinds of terrible health outcomes, um, disease, increased risk of accidents, um, yeah, an early death. So no one argues about that, but there is a lot of debate about what is healthy, moderate drinking look like, like how much is safe and is a little bit of alcohol protective in some way. And um, that's kind of this hugely heated area of research and um, one for which, yeah, getting these really um, nuanced, getting the kind of studies we'd need to equivocally answer that is almost impossible. Right. You need a, ideally some kind of, kind of randomized control trial where you also had a lot of control over consumption as opposed yep. to just asking people in a survey after the fact, which is what this tip, kind of observational study typically does. I, I just want to reference an early econ talk guest, old friend of mine, Don Cox, who went at a meeting in a discussion of causation, someone had the uh, courage to suggest there might be another factor involved besides, in this case, say, alcohol. And uh, someone else at the meeting says, you mean the dreaded third thing? And in the case of these kind of studies, it's third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. There's, there's many, many factors, as you point out, that might be the underlying causal variable and which would mislead us in drawing a, an accurate conclusion about the impact of a little bit more of alcohol in our consumption. Totally. And then it's also like, what what kind of alcohol are we talking about? So there was another study that came out also in the Lancet earlier this year, and they were looking at um, the health effects of alcohol. And then in the supplementary materials, they broke down um, and it was also a meta-analysis. So they, they were basing their conclusions on many, many studies. And in the supplemental materials, they looked at the health effects by alcohol type. And you could very quickly see that... Um, uh, beer drinkers had much worse health outcomes than wine drinkers, but they also um, collated the socioeconomic characteristics yeah. of the beer versus wine drinkers. Not the same. Yeah, so unsurprisingly, they look Shocking. completely different, different levels of education, different types of work. Um, yeah, Weight. different. Exactly, yeah, and poverty. Um, Age, uh, everything. Yeah. So basically everything was different Gender. and, yeah. <laughs> Um, so it's a really, I really feel for um, nutrition researchers and there are so many people who are doing great work. Um, but I think, yeah, sometimes they themselves go too far in the conclusions of these studies. And then we in the media um, often completely just <laughs> misrepresent what the research actually shows. But not you, Julia, because I've, res I've read a lot of your work and you're actually, I'm, I'm half teasing you, but I think it's true that you're, you're more careful than the average certainly than the average person in the media who often has the natural temptation to get on the front page and to dramatize a finding. And of course, that's what these uh, scholars did who did the study. 
I, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on why they said none, given that their results suggested one is where the danger kicks in to the extent it kicks in. And it's still, again, extremely low risk at low right. levels. I think, yeah, I, I don't know what, what was going through their minds, but I can guess that they might have been trying to draw attention to um, the very well-known health risks associated with drinking. And this was, a, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, it was a global burden of disease study. So this is where they're very carefully trying to to um, get a measure on how, like what kind of health impact is alcohol having um, on, yeah, on populations around the world. And uh, so, so you can imagine that they were trying to draw attention to the very serious and awful health risks of, of alcohol and of drinking too much. And so maybe, yeah, they were just tempted to take it a little bit further and, um, yeah, kind of exaggerate the finding uh, to draw attention to those risks. And, you, yeah, you could yeah. argue it was well-intentioned. They were just better safe than sorry. Right. Uh, but that's bad science. It, it might be good right. parenting. <laughs> right. Maybe, yeah. maybe. But it's certainly uh, not good science, which is a shame. And I think, yeah, some people felt like they were moralizing as well. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Well, yeah, I remember the – I always misquote this. I don't get this quote exactly right, but it's close, you know. H.L. Uh, Mencken said, Puritanism is the haunting fear that someone somewhere is having a good time. So there is a, <laughs> an aspect of that, I think, in these sometimes in these kinds of um, uh, preaching aspects right. of the study. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I think one other interesting nuance to this alcohol story is um, the New York Times has done this incredible incredible reporting on the influence the industry has had on shaping alcohol research, even within the National Institutes of Health. Yeah. And, and this is all about, um, you know, the, the industry wanting to be able to say moderate, you know, a couple glasses of wine can actually make you live longer and protect your heart or whatever it is. And uh, funding studies and, you know, having influence over how, as we know, like, yeah, the way you design a study, the questions you choose to ask, the people you include, um, how you interpret those findings shape what 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 the conclusions end up being. And and um, the Times investigations have showed that uh, the alcohol industry has had a hand in that. Not and surprised. So not, not, not surprised at all. Yeah, I guess when you look at um, how much re well, industry money at stake. <laughs> totally and how much industry shapes um, many different areas of research but um, so yeah it is it is this like very contentious question and one of ongoing debate and um, but one I'm afraid we're not going to have very satisfying answers to anytime soon yeah, well this study could have been funded by the cannabis the growing uh, cannabis uh, association, but right. looking for to make a, comp, a competitor more uh, less attractive, and more right. expensive. Big uh, cannabis, riskier. yeah, yeah, big cannabis. That's common. It's common. <laughs> right. Uh, did we learn anything from this study? By the way, I want to just mention it's important that there is a temptation. We've talked about this before. I think with Johnny and Edie's that that when you do a meta analysis, that wow, it had eight hundred studies. It must be really reliable. But of course, if the 800 studies all use the same flawed methodology, you don't get any more light uh, shed than if you only had one uh, bad study. They're all kind of the same. Uh, do we learn anything from this? Did you learn anything from this meta-analysis that was helpful? I think one one place it was helpful was in estimating that global burden of disease um, aspect. So I actually I called John Yanides about this because right when – the paper came out, he had just come out with this fantastic um, critique of nutrition science. And let me find out what he says. Oh, yeah. In, the, in this um, in this paper, he talks about how like the absurdity of all the health claims that are made based on these really shaky studies and how like eating 12 hazelnuts a day can prolong your life by 12 years, according to some papers. And one <laughs> egg reduces life expectancy by six years. And um, he pulls out all these really spurious findings um, that are based on observational studies. But anyway, so th side, that was a side note. So, so I was talking with him about the value of the paper and he was saying – um, and I agree with him that it, it wasn't estimating alcohol, the, the disease burden of alcohol, um, you know, that, that it, it, 
with a reminder about how it increases liver disease and um, the risk of high blood pressure, injury, memory, um, many other health problems. So I think, yeah, that that was, uh, yeah, kind of a big um, value to this, to have those global burden of disease studies. Um, but yeah, at the last... Maybe to, to quantify in some way what the full impact might be. Yes. At the of, current of, levels of drinking, say. Right, yeah. And they were looking at um, 195, they were looking at data from 195 countries. Um, and yeah, that, that was actually, so that was the main purpose of the study. So so the, the study was really valuable in that it, it, um, it, it estimated the burden of alcohol-related disease in 195 countries. But then that, that one um, striking conclusion where that the yeah, zero drinks is the only safe level is what everyone grabbed onto and what everyone reported about um, instead of what the actual purpose of the study was, which was estimating alcohol's disease burden. So, Well, I think, John, when, when Johnny Anitas was on this program, I think he said we should never – take seriously any observational study about the impact of one food or drink on human health. Right. And I, I assume when, when he said that, I, I assume he, I, I'm sure he believes that excessive drinking is a bad idea, as is, say, eating uh, 10 or 12 pounds of broccoli every day. But the the sort of normal range of human experience is not reliably measured by these observational studies, and yet they continue to be done constantly. Right. Yeah. And there's so many questions like when when you have when you look at studies, for example, on the impact of eating meat, um, there's a lot of question about the the preparation that you're using. So is there something about the way we cook the meat that increases um, yeah, its toxicity and the way it's processed in the body or um, with with any type of food? If you're adding one thing to your diet, you're subtracting another. So even if you like randomize people to fish and meat eating, that means that the people who are eating the fish are eating less meat and the people who are eating the the um, meat are eating less fish. And so is it the effect of the new food you're introducing or of taking out the other food that's having that impact? And how is eating more fish changing the rest of your diet? And um, yeah, and obviously we're eating, so we're eating foods and all these different kinds of combinations and they're prepared in many different ways and when we add more one thing we're taking away another thing so teasing out as as john suggests this this um the effect on one health outcome of one particular food is almost impossible um through the through yeah the observational studies and even otherwise like if you want to run a big randomized control trial on i don't know say like our blueberries really <laughs> really um, that beneficial to health. Like, yeah, are you going to randomize people from birth to eating more blueberries? And then if they're eating more blueberries, what, are, what aren't they eating um, otherwise? And uh, so yeah, it, so it goes on and on. And it's a really tricky, tricky area. I just want to make clear. I just want to make clear that, of course, here on EconTalk, we do not give health advice. So anything you hear today, you must take with a grain of at least of salt. Some people think salt's bad for you. I don't particularly, but that's just my personal opinion, and I would not encourage you to rely on it. Um, and same goes for drinking, say, or uh, anything else we're discussing. So I, I do want to make that disclaimer. Consult your local nutritionist, doctor, or statistician before uh, acting on anything you learn in today's episode. But before we move on, I just want to mention my favorite alcohol-related study – which was about uh, maybe 12 or so years ago. Uh, it made the front page of the New York Times, made the front page of many, many, many papers and, and magazines and websites, which I think were still were existing at that point. Uh, and it showed purportedly that alcohol consumption by women, uh, particularly I think wine, led to an increase in certain types of cancers. And I looked at the study fairly carefully. I may have mentioned this before, but it's always – to me, this is such a horrible study, it's worth repeating. Uh, they it threw out from their study non-drinkers. And the justification mm -hmm. was, I'm going to tell you the justification in a second, but I just want to mention in the raw data, uh, people who drank small amounts had better health and less cancer than the zero drinkers. And that, of course, is an example potentially – 
not for sure, but potentially of what's called hormesis, the idea that the dose makes the poison and that many things that could kill you in large amounts are actually not just benign, but beneficial in small amounts. Alcohol has been suggested as to being one of those. We don't know for sure, as we've been talking about, but there is some peop- some evidence that that might be true. So here they have this awkward conclusion. They want to tell you that drinking causes cancer, but it appears that at very low levels, drinking reduces your risk of cancer. So they threw out the people who didn't drink at all. So the only people in their population were drinkers, and they found that among drinkers, higher levels of alcohol were, of course, very bad for you. And that's not, again, surprising. The question is, what happens at lowish levels? If you have one and a half or two drinks a day, does that raise your risk by how much? How do you offset that against perhaps the reductions in stress, which are also uh, beneficial to your health that alcohol might provide, et cetera, et cetera? But what I what I loved is their justification for why they eliminated the non-drinkers. And their what they said was, we have to eliminate the non-drinkers because some of them could be non-drinkers today, but in the past they could have been heavy drinkers, and that'll contaminate the data. Of course, the problem with that is that. In the past, the people who were drinking five glasses of wine a day could have been teetotalers drinking zero. So once you've opened that Pandora's box that past, uh, you know, data based on past memory is is suspect, the whole study is suspect. Right. Wow. I didn't I didn't see this. So you said that was like a dozen years ago. Yeah, it's about 12 years. I'll try to dig it up for you. It drove me crazy. Uh, They didn't control for cancer in the family. They had those data. I don't know why they didn't control you know i don't know it's it but so do you think yeah um, go ahead do you think it's the media was this so this wasn't just a case of the media um going yeah no. over interpreting the results no and the, the researchers this is a really bad yeah yeah because that's mm-hmm. the incentives for the media are not so healthy right now the incentives for scholars are not so healthy right. you, you want to get tenure you want to get attention you want to get love from funders from your university from your totally. hospital your natural incentive is to exaggerate, dramatize, um, just where we are. Yeah, a little while back, we did this um, chart showing like, yeah, where when, when, when science, like from the moment um, an idea in science is generated to the time it's published in the media, all the places it goes off the rails. And there's so many, so many places. Give, um, some, give some examples. Yeah, so you, so I guess from... Well, from the beginning, from when you're conceiving a study, so when you're thinking about what population are you going to use, are they really a representative population, uh, you know, the one one that really makes sense um, studying, and then how many people are you going to put in the study? Will it be enough to, to show a real result, or is it going to be too small? And um, And then, so yeah, from the study design, and then interpreting your data, um, and if you have like a multi-site study, making sure did everyone at these different sites follow the protocols for the study properly and in the same way. So to make sure we're all doing the same thing that we're say, that, that making sure we all have the same intervention that we're suggesting is um, what we're looking at here. And then from that, so that, so then that's, I guess, yeah, running the study and then interpreting the results. So we have all these incentives and reasons, including our own biases and things we're not even aware of when we're looking at data, and um, that might shape how we interpret the results. And then you end up, yeah, and then you're publishing the study, and you might have co-authors who are tweaking things, or the journal might be tweaking things, and then then a press release comes out about the study, and that might um, watered down or shift the findings in some way, and then the media report on the study, and um, we might misinterpret, overinterpret, misrepresent. So there are all these places where research can go off the rails. And yeah, I think you, I don't know. Have you ever talked to Sheila Jasanoff? This, no. this. Um, so she's she pioneered the science technology studies program at Harvard, um, in the Kennedy School there, and she's really interested in this idea of science as a human process and. Um, you know, it's obviously, I think, the best way we have of getting at the truth, but it is done by humans. It is, yeah, conceptualized by humans, and there's all these places where um, where it can go off the rails, and we need to build in protections for that um, and make sure, yeah, that we account for that. 
you know, we've had Brian Nezick on talking about the replication crisis in, in psychology and, of course, but now beyond psychology, the natural incentives to hide results that aren't interesting, that don't come out well, means that the studies that we do observe probably are not as reliable. They tend to come from the right-hand tail or the left-hand tail of the possible results. There's a lot of, of error, uh, and that's just uh, that's just the reality. You wrote a, an essay – for Vox, I, I think it was in the last five years, but it's one of my favorite pieces of journalism, partly because of the visual representation that you give in there. You, you, you looked at, I think it was your chart. I don't know, maybe you created it, but maybe you got it from somewhere else. But it's basically, you took a whole bunch of pieces of our diet, caffeine, broccoli, uh, meat, carbs, et cetera, and you showed uh, which studies – how many studies showed that they increased the risk of cancer and which showed it, studies showed that they decreased the risk? And basically for every single item in the list, and there were probably 15 or 20, uh, there were lots of studies that showed, oh, my gosh, this causes cancer. And then there are also lots of studies that shows that they reduce cancer. And I think um, that's a very sobering and thoughtful finding that should create skepticism among uh, thoughtful readers of, of the, the media and uh, in terms of how you think about your own di- one's own diet. Totally. And I wish we could take credit for that, but that was actually also John Yanides. Um, we did we did reproduce it in that story, but it was another, John Yanides came up with this idea of like, I think it's the one where he flips through the Boston, Boston cooking school cookbook and randomly selects foods and then looked at what, what's been published uh, showing that that food causes or protects cancer. And then um, they had this amazing chart in that study. It was, yeah, really, really well, we'll fun put, idea. We'll put up a link up to your version of it, which is extremely accessible, as well as to John's, which is probably less accessible, but he's pretty accessible. He's pretty um, accessible. Before, before we move on, we're going to move on in a minute to metabolism and diet, which you've got some really interesting personal and I think uh, scientific insights into. But I want to ask before we do that, uh, what's the single biggest fallacy about health or nutrition that you, if you could just clear this up, you think this is, you know, everybody should know this, but they don't. Is there anything that jumps out at you uh, from your reading of, of the nutrition space or the health space more generally? I think one, one, this maybe isn't, I don't know if this is what you're looking, you're thinking of, but um I think we make things way too complicated, especially in this country. Like there, there are so many vested interests and um, people who are trying to profit off of making, you know, certain diet claims or exercise claims. And what we actually know in research to be, you know, like, what does it mean to live a healthy life? It's like, don't smoke, don't drink too much, eat a diet that's pretty rich in fruits and vegetables, make sure you get an adequate amount of sleep, make sure you have a strong social network um, and people, you know, that love you and that you can depend on. And am I forgetting one? So smoking, no, drinking. Uh, stay act, a little act, be a little yeah, active. active. You don't have to be a marathoner, but. Um. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess that that's another one, actually, that we have, I think, this idea that if you want to lose weight, you have to join a gym <laughs> and start to exercise like a fiend. Well, that's that's and, a belief that's held by people who've never visited a gym. When I when I started going to a gym a couple of years ago and I saw the people there, I thought, I hope they're new like me. <laughs> Right. Okay. There we go. Yeah, no, but, but what we know for, for at least when it, so exercise is like the closest thing we have to a, a magic pill. Yeah. I think like it does so many incredible things for us and, and it helps people maintain their body weight, but it's actually not that effective for weight loss. But, and, and that's because I think when people, well, what researchers have found that, you know, when people ramp up the amount of exercise they do, they tend to think, you know, I can now go home and have a big slice of pizza when really you don't actually burn often, unless you're doing like hours and hours of exercise, you don't burn that much, um, as much as you think you do, as much as exercise machines say. And Mm -hmm. it's really easy to undo that calorie deficit that you've created with like a single slice of pizza or um, a frappuccino at, you know, Starbucks or whatever it is that um, that people are eating these days. So yeah, I think that that mix of like overcomplication and then relying on this like one silver bullet for health, be it exercise or um, a certain food or a certain diet, I think is where, where we're often going wrong. 
you know, we have such a, you know, you said, I think uh, it doesn't, it doesn't burn as many calories as we think it does. I, I would just put a slight uh, amendment to that. I would say it doesn't burn as many calories as we'd like to think it does. <laughs> so totally, yeah. the, the ability to self-deceive there, honestly, just thinking you're actually have burned a lot when in fact, yeah, I just really want that frappuccino uh, it, it is a huge problem, as is the quest for the magic solution. You know, the, the set, my favorite of this example is the seven minute workout. You know, I don't really have to exercise. I just do just work for I, just seven minutes and I'll be and there's an app on my phone I can get. And, you know, we're always looking for the shortcut, the magic food that will solve our problems. And like most things in life, um, it's it's mainly hard work and and sacrifice, which leads to, say, lower weight or health. And it's just that's not as much fun as believing that this new book with this new diet is going to take care of me. Totally. And it's sustained work. It's like yeah. um, something you kind of have to think about, even if like I, I am someone who did lose weight, you know, over I was chubbier as a teenager and slowly lost weight. And it's like a, it's a, been a sustained effort and something that I still think about every day. And I think that's true for a lot of people who lose weight and keep it off. It's not like suddenly you discover this magic solution and you never need to think about it again. Um, it's something that that lingers there, and um, and I think on the on the flip side, it's like if you have one day where, or even two days in a week where you know maybe you eat a little bit too much or you know, an extra slice of cake that you shouldn't have had or whatever it is, you don't. It's it's not the end of the world. Like what really matters is how are you eating over many months in a year and how 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 does that look on balance? Not you know like obsessing about every little micro um, decision that you make about what you're putting in your body. Yeah, Mark Twain said, it's easy to stop smoking. I've done it a score of times. I feel that way about losing weight. It's easy to lose weight. I've done it. I'm really good at it. And I forget that I'm really good at putting it back on too. And of course, that's yes. they say that's not good for you either. Um, I, I've always been attracted to the Kingsley Amos line. Um, Inside every fat person is a fatter person trying to get out. <laughs> I, I sometimes think of myself that way. I, you know, it's like, let's just go to my natural weight. You know, that's it's probably about 20 or 30 pounds above what I'm already way above <laughs> right now. So it does take it does take some discipline. It takes long term discipline. And I think the the behavioral insight, uh, which I've talked about before on the program, is sometimes you need very um, black and white rules that are very different from, I just won't have too many potato chips. Right. Uh, I can't keep that rule, unfortunately. I, I'm just going to only have a little bit of the ice cream. I guess, yeah, I should say, and I hope I, I'm not contradicting what I said earlier, but I do think that yeah, after writing about this for so many years, like where, where I, I am really coming out is our food environment here is just a nightmare. And it does make it really hard for people to make you know, the correct, like maybe choices that are the best choice for themselves. Um, and I, I, so I think, yeah, I guess the, the, yeah, it is, it is discipline. It is sustained effort on the other, on the other side, we, we are living in a food environment where um, obesity does have a chance to express itself on a much more frequent level than it did a um, hundred years ago, oh, say. Yeah. Um, and, you know, our genes, like there's a researcher at NIH who's fantastic on this called Kevin Hall. And he always talks about how our genes haven't changed that much in the last, um, you know, half century. But but what has changed is the frappuccinos and the pizzas and the sheer ubiquity of these things. And the fact that they're like you almost have to I, I personally feel like I, I have to, you know, think be quite judicious and like think very deliberately about where I buy my food and um, yeah, exposing myself to these things, you know, you have to make a really conscious effort not to. And so it, it is on the individual, but I think it's also very much an, a massive environmental problem. Um, and yeah. yeah. Well, we're really good at food. We're really yeah. good at making inexpensive, really yummy food. It's a, it's a triumph of human creativity and ingenuity, but it's not necessarily uh, what we want in the long run. We very much want it in the short run. And I, have a, I have a thing with my wife. I think this is an example of what you're talking about where she will sometimes say to me after a meal, would you like a little ice cream for dessert? And the answer is, to, I always want to say, 
Well, of course I do. What kind of a question is that? And second point being, don't ask. Please don't ask. It's so hard to say no, even though I don't want it. It's yeah, still, I mean, even though I don't think I should eat it, it's very hard not to say, uh, it's very hard to say no to that. And, uh, and part of it, by the way, is I think just human interaction. My wife offers it in, in, in a, with a full heart. She doesn't offer it because it's like, oh, well, do you want some ice cream? For her, it's correctly, it's a festive moment. It's dessert. It's part of the joy of being human is to human eat ritual. good things. Yeah, and yeah. ritual. And, 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 and I want to, we want to do this together. Let's have some ice cream. Uh, so, uh, anyway. no, totally. Uh, we could get, we could talk about Brian Wansing too, who had, who just his, I guess his old research program. I don't know if you followed this. Oh yeah. But- you can mention that. Go ahead. Brian Wansing is an eating behavior researcher at Cornell, and he published these really interesting studies showing how these little nudges and environmental cues cause us, they they shape our food choices and they cause us to eat less or eat a little bit more um, in certain circumstances. And um, he had just really creative studies to to demonstrate that. And of course, um, when some other researchers looked into the data and the methods that he was using, they found a lot of problems and now he's he's um, stepped down from his position and he's being investigated and um, uh, all of that. But but I think but yeah, he's not the only researcher to show that um, that yeah that that the, the the things that we're offered and the things that we have in our environment shape the choices we make and like you know if you have ice cream at home if it's there it's on you then to say no to the ice cream and the ice cream is designed to be eaten and to be overeaten and it's the I Alice think, in Wonderland dessert eat me right exactly <laughs> it's yelling and it's so hard to to I think to say no and I think yeah as much like Brian Wansing's research might be hugely problematic statistically and methodologically but is on um, but yeah, his, his idea is he's not the only one who was who was talking about th- these subtle environmental cues and like how important it is to to think about them even in our own ho- homes and in our workplaces and um, yeah. So, I, uh, sorry. So, so we keep our ice cream with a with a neighbor who we don't like, and so when my <laughs> wife says, "Do you want some ice cream?" and I say, "Sure," she's, "Oh, but we've got to go over to the Johnsons, and you know they don't." They're not really happy to see us, so let's maybe we'll just skip it tonight. No, I'm genius. kidding. But genius. it is it is important to not buy some something you should not be bought. Um, totally, because yeah. I can't. They they they've got like a. Uh, I remember when I was when I was learning uh, time management, uh, which I couldn't implement, but it was fun to study it anyway. I couldn't keep any of the rules, but I love learning about them. I even taught them for a while until I realized I couldn't keep them, and I thought this is probably inappropriate, uh, but. But someone, uh, classic uh, insight in the Franklin time management was that someone, the teacher would say, well, do you wish you read, you read more books? And everyone's hand goes up. Yes, of course, I wish I read more books. And um, the teacher would say, well, why don't you? And everybody would all kind of down at their shoes. And his answer was, books don't ring. Uh, when the phone rings, it grabs your attention uh, and you are – you answer it even though it's not – of course, we've gotten better at not answering our phones in America, but it's an old stud, an old sur, uh, seminar. But the things that grab our attention, either because they stimulate our our appetites or our juices or whatever it is, they they grab us. And sometimes the healthier things are just sitting there quietly <laughs> ignored thinking, what about me? Absolutely. Yeah. And and you, I think, yeah, people I, – I always think about this, how, how – and maybe it's helpful to other people to think about that, like the bag of chips and the ice cream. It was designed by incredible scientists and these big food companies to like, you know, they they, they tested it on different people to see <laughs> which formulation would cause people to yeah. to not be able to stop themselves and to want to like what was the most pleasing to, to our brains and reward systems. Yeah. And um, it's a pretty tough thing is just yeah, individuals to be up against. But you can do it out there. Come on. But, yeah. but at the other time, yeah, uh, we don't want to be uh, saying you shouldn't have any fun in your life. So Right, of course. Anyway, yeah. Let's shift gears. I, w- I want to talk about something you wrote about that really fascinated me. Uh, it's related to what we're talking about now, so it's an easy segue, which is you spent 23 hours in a metabolic chamber 
So explain what a metabolic chamber is and what that was like and what you learned from it. My husband thought I was crazy, so that's the first thing. Um, but no, so so the National Institutes of Health, they have these rooms here um, on the outskirts of uh, of Washington, and they're um, designed to measure these chemical processes we call metabolism second by second. So essentially the food we eat and the amount of work we're doing, the amount of physical activity we're doing, um, corresponds to how quickly our body is breaking down um, yeah, breaking down the food that we're eating to use for energy to power our cells. And the way that's measured is by, by in these airtight rooms, um, researchers track how quickly you're um, respiring uh, CO2. So like how, how, how much oxygen you're consuming and how much carbon dioxide you're, you're letting out um, gives, gives a measure for how quickly you're burning energy. Um, so, so that's so. So they're, they're, they have an ongoing study where they take people who have a normal body weight and people who are overweight and obese, and they put them um, through different types of measurements to better understand the, the characteristics of their condition, their body size, and um, one of those is the, this what's called the metabolic chamber, and that's where yeah, it's this airtight room that. Um, that measures your gas exchange second to second. And so I went in thinking one of the reasons, um, you know, again, like I struggled with my weight when I was a, especially when I was a teenager and, and um, I really thought like, you know, I could look at my brothers and they were both skinny and they seemed to be able to eat whatever they wanted. And same with my friends. And I thought, okay, there's something going on in me. And I, I thought it was a slow metabolism um, I thought like there was, you know, this sluggish, like I wasn't converting the food I was eating um, uh, or using it very quickly and it was being stored as fat and therefore I could gain weight more easily than they could. And so I went went into the chamber to both better understand this hugely important si scientific tool that has led to some of the discoveries we've been talking about today, like the relative importance of physical activity for weight loss. Um, and many, many other things, and and also to to get a better read on my own body and and whether I had this slow metabolism I thought I was cursed with. <laughs> and and by right. the way, you only ran it only. You're in it for 23 hours. I, I, there's do people other people go in for longer. I think they they don't keep people longer than two days, if I'm remembering correctly, in the chamber. Um, because they don't so, know what you ate before you got in there or how much exercise you did or whether you, you know, it's like the guy, guy told me that, I think it was a doctor told me that, you know, somebody came in for a cholesterol measurement and it was a horrible, finally, frighteningly like a record. And then he found out the guy had been eating French fries beforehand and hadn't washed his hands. So he's, you know, it was a bad read. Uh, but you'd think there'd be things you could do before that test that would kind of mess it up. Before the metabolic chamber? Yeah. Um, so, so the one of the big fascinating takeaways of spending this time researching the metabolism and with these researchers at NIH was that many of the things we do that we think, you know, there, there's this whole like popular mythology discourse or, or yeah, it's, it is mythology around metabolism boosters and doing certain things to speed up your metabolic processes and, you know, yeah, burn off that food faster and make sure you're um, you know, like I think that the underlying thread is that we we can exert some degree of control over our metabolism. But what you what they see in the chamber and what they've shown through these like different fascinating studies is that we are actually um, there's very little we can do to control it. And, uh, you know, these these metabolic processes are adapting second to second to our environment in ways over which we have little control. So for example, they put people um, inside the chamber in very cold temperatures and they found that, the, and, and then they also, sorry, and then they tracked them and they put them back in the chamber in normal temperatures. And I think they slept, so they slept in the chamber in cold temperatures for a significant period of time. I can't remember exactly how long it was. But it was enough time to show that our bodies build up brown fat in response to that cold. So brown fat is the type of fat that um, that helps us stay warm. 
And so, you know, that this, this is a metabolic process. Like your, your body, your body is taking the food that you're eating and converting it into brown fat to keep you warm because you're exposed to cold temperatures. And so this is something you're not thinking about and you have no, like absolutely no control over it. And, and then in this study, when they, you can think about it as much as you want. You're not going to change it. <laughs> right. And then and then you're then in this study, they were allowing people, the same people to sleep in normal, like warmer temperatures and the brown fat, their brown fat reserves went down again. And so there's all these things happening in our bodies at like any given moment. And, and sorry, and just to be clear now, don't go and sleep in very cold temperatures and think you're going to lose a lot of weight. It was, was a very like insignificant amount um, of change in their energy burn. And, but it is something now they're trying to see if they can create a drug that has a more dramatic effect to similar pathways. But, um, but, but sorry, the main message is that there, there really wasn't much I could do before going into the chamber that would have like a big effect on, um, a significant effect on my metabolism, you know, that, that I could deliberately do. And, and what, so they've shown like, yeah, eating dark chocolate or caffeine or chili peppers, these don't speed up people's metabolisms in ways that lead to weight loss. Mm. It's just by what Dr. Oz says every day. I, I, I like, to, I just try to read about thin people. That's what works for me. And then my body thinks, oh, I could do that. Let me try. And so a lot of this stuff is, um, is again, more hope than, than reality. But what did you find out about yourself? So I found out I'm a very boring research subject. Um, <laughs> I had a very like perfectly normal, I did the, the exact, um, my, my metabolic rate was exactly what, what they'd have predicted for someone, my height, my body, my size and my age and sex. So I was boring and, um, I was surprised by this. I really thought, like, I, I don't, I definitely, um, you know, exercise and I'm careful about my diet and all these things. I don't just blame my metabolism for um, when I gain weight. But I did think it was this contributor that I really thought I had this like sluggish metabolism and that it, that explained like why it's a little bit harder for me. And so I debunked that. And yeah, it caused me to think a lot about um, where we get these narratives from and this messaging and um, how much they affect how we think about ourselves and how sometimes, yeah, I can be completely wrong. So you've lost this crutch. Are you less happy now? <laughs> Am I less happy? <laughs> um, I, I would say I'm happier. I think there's some, yeah, yeah, liberty in knowing the truth, right? Sure. I, I like what you wrote. You said, um, going back to our gym discussion, uh, and of course, in the gym, you do have people slowly pedaling an exercise bike uh, with no, much, not much resistance. And I'm always thinking, what do they think they're doing here? But you're right. What's because there was an exercise bike in the little room because they wanted you to exercise. So you say, what's more, the 405 calories I burned during 90 minutes on the exercise bike was both less than is advertised in spinning classes. And just 17% of the total calories I'd used, validating once again that workouts typically account for a relatively minor part of total energy expenditure. Well, that's true, but you could, one could up, in theory, one could up one's uh, exercise and over a long period of time make a big dent, but yep. it's just hard to do. And it, I think yeah, you can absolutely do that. I think the question is, is that a sustainable method of weight loss relative to thinking a little more about the food you put in your body, which we know has much more of an impact on um, how, yeah, how much weight you gain or lose. So um, for, for like, I, I have a friend here who he had a period of um, kind of between jobs and had a lot of free time and he was exercising like crazy and he lost a pretty good amount of weight but now he started to work again and he doesn't have time to do you know one hour of running and an hour of weight lifting every day and I think most people don't so like using that as your exclusive um, way to control your weight isn't isn't really a reasonable approach for people who have normal lives, jobs, families, et cetera. And we've had Gary Taubes on this program, and uh, he's, I'd say, known for two things among others, but the two that come to mind that he's talked about on the program. He's not a big fan of sugar, uh, which probably could add join your list of things we know, probably excessive amounts of sugar, not particularly good for you, maybe 
no amount's particularly good for you. Uh, and he's also known for advocating a low-carb diet as potentially at least a way to reduce uh, weight. You wrote, I think in this article uh, on the metabolism, the metabolic chamber. When it comes to diets, the researchers have also debunked the notion that bodies burn more body fat while on a high fat and low carb ketogenic diet compared to a higher carb diet, despite all the hype. Do you think that's a pretty ironclad conclusion? So I think, I don't know if it's ironclad, like anything in science, it's an iterative process. And maybe I know these researchers are also working on comparative studies where they look at low carb, they, they, they look at more head to head um, outcomes, uh, sorry, people following different diets, compare them and look at their different outcomes. I think where I diverge from Gary, I think he's he's absolutely right that when, it, when, you, when we talk about the changing food environment, the big thing that has changed is this, where we're inundated with processed cheap calories and many of them are taking the form of sugary, car, you know, Car-car. carbohydrate. Yeah. However, at the same time, people have been eating a lot more of other things too. So our fat consumption has gone up. We're, we're eating more calories generally. I don't, I think it's simplistic to say it's only like sugar is the only problem and, and it's reductionist. I think there are many other things that um, that have changed about our diets and people are consuming more of, you know, and we're also consuming more protein, for example. So meat consumption continues to go up. Um, che- you know, like we eat a ton of cheese and like, I, I, I don't think it's just, just the sugar. I would love if it, there was like one simple thing that um, we could say is the problem, but I, I don't think it's just just no, that. but that's a stronger claim that that a low. I mean, either way, I have many listeners who've written me after the Gary Tobbs episode said they cut down carbs. Many, I'm sure, are listening right now, and they write me and say, "I lost 40 pounds and I've kept it off for three years," which blows me away. Because for me, when I reduce my carb consumption, it does. I do tend to lose weight. I just my body it gets so unhappy with me right. <laughs> that it says, "Give me back that first potato chip." It goes crazy for it and. And responds, of course, very strongly by adding a lot of fat. And I, I'm curious whether you think that, that that's open and shut about just low carbs in general. Okay, so yeah, where, where you were asking about that, I think, specific study as well. So yeah. what they were testing was this claim that some people who, yeah, keto, proponents of the ketogenic diet make, which is that once you go keto, you can kind of eat whatever you, not you, sorry, whatever you want of certain food types. Um, and your fat, you know, your fat burn will accelerate. You don't need to worry too much about the calories. Um, there was a recent diet book, um, by a doctor at Harvard who, um, I think he said, you can retrain your fat cells and like stop worrying about calories forever if you just follow the ketogenic diet. And what and is, what they explain think, what the ketogenic diet is. What it's is a it? very, so you're, you're eating like, oh God, I'm going to mess this up, but it's a very low carb, high fat diet. So you're eating, you're staying away from definitely like processed carbs, pastas, breads, um, sugary foods, and you're subsisting and even fruits, by the way, and you're, you're subsisting mainly on protein rich foods and, and fats. It's a paleo like diet. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And so what they're testing in the a study that that it, at, at NIH was whether fat burn and yeah whether your calorie and fat burn really accelerate when you're following a ketogenic diet and they found that wasn't the case um, and so I think I think for some people it's absolutely a wonderful way to live like you know some people do need these I think and Gary is one of them like he need he's talked to me about um, needing these strict parameters. Um, you know, like he can't have just a little bit of chocolate. He he has to just like cut out the chocolate completely. Um, and so for some people, I think it can absolutely work. And, and it sounds like it's worked for some of your listeners. I think for the majority of people or many other people, it's very hard to live that way. And it's very hard to live that way in our current food environment. Of course, um, I, have other, I have friends who, who believe the China study, which I don't. I think it's really bad science, but they tell me that they believe the China study. They've cut out blah, blah, blah from their diet. They say they're vegetarian now and they've lost all this weight and they've kept it off. So all one of my, power to them. Yeah, one of my theories is uh, if you believe the diet, it won't work. But otherwise, for the average person, it doesn't. I don't know. Yeah. And that's a, that is the difference between like so in every diet study, they find this massive individual variation. So. 
I like every time you can, they, there was a recent study out of Stanford called the diet fit study. And they compared people following a low carb versus like just a regular, like a higher carb diet. And the, the results were virtually superimposable. And what they looked like was that the, on average, people didn't lose that much weight. But in both groups, there were people who lost a lot and gained some. <laughs> and so there was this variation. And, and I think um, I think that's true for every diet. And I think for, for many people, it's like a matter for many people it's experimenting with different things, finding out what works for you. But I think the bottom line is that you need to eat fewer calories. Like you, you can just eat what, you know, even like on a ketogenic diet, you can eat as the, the NIH study showed as much as you want and, and be able to magically accelerate your fat burn and lose weight. Um, so yeah. Yeah, that, that's where I, I come out. But I think the science is still evolving and maybe um, we'll find out that ketogenic diets are what we should all be eating. I don't know. But for now, I'm, I'm not convinced. You know, I'm, it's not surprising that, that your response to carbs might be different from mine. Your response to fat might be different from mine. I mean, one of the lessons, I think, of nutrition and diet and metabolism, very similar to the lessons in economics, you have complex systems a policy intervention that might work in one town might not work in another. It might work for one group, but not for another. It might not work at all. It's an illusion based on reverse causation and the and the problem of, of confounding variables that you talked about. And it's a complex system, which means also that the body, which means that changing one thing can lead to changes in the other thing that you don't control. And you have a beautiful example of this in your summary of what we know about metabolism, another piece you wrote, where you say – dieting can slow down your metabolism it's like what <laughs> yeah that that one we have to be careful with because that's also another study that came out of this group at nih but they found that um so so your diet does your metabolism does slow down a little bit it recalibrates when you're losing weight but it, no, re, it normalizes again so if you don't have as many fat cells in your body you don't you, you don't have as if you're shrinking there's not as much you don't require as much energy to to sustain um to to you don't require as much energy to live and your metabolism will slow down a little bit but where where that claim came out of was th there was a big uh, study of the biggest loser TV show participants at, at NIH of all places. Hmm. And they found that, um, that the, these people who went, they went on crash diets. So they vastly cut their calorie intake and ramped up like to hours of exercise a day and they destroyed their metabolisms in the process. So they, hmm. they saw a uh, would look like a permanent decrease in their metabolic rate. And so their body was like fighting to hang on to every calorie they were eating. And it made their weight, it made maintaining their weight loss almost impossible. And over the long term, when these when these TV show contestants were followed up by the NIH researchers, many of them had regained their weight and some of them even gained more weight than they went into the TV show with. So, um, I, and I think the big message there was, they, you know, if you that that might have been more of a response to their the extreme intervention that they put themselves through. But it's not um, so than, than what than what everyone might experience by just you know trying to eat a little bit less each day. You know what I mean? Sure, but it wouldn't yeah. be surprising if when you were losing weight, your body might be thinking, "Uh oh, famine. Uh oh, right. Food supply not available. Conserve. Take it easy. You know, take care." So. My point is that, you know, there, there are these unintended consequences in in our bodies that are not that different from the unintended consequences of, of public policy that don't turn out the way we expect because things change that we don't expect to change. It's a complex system. Absolutely. Yep. So, so we're almost out of time. I just I want to close with uh, you can talk a little bit about more about exercise and, and what you learned from uh, you know, I think we do have a romance about the opportunity, the ability of exercise and in your time in the chamber, uh, you learned some some things about that. When you were riding that exercise bike, I, I'm curious how hard you were pedaling. That's number one. But more generally, is there anything we, we've we've talked we've gone all over the place? It's all been interesting. But are there any lessons for losing weight that other than eating a little bit less every day? From okay, hmm. 
I think so. One other thing I did in the study was uh, I had to estimate my calorie consumption (laughs) and I thought I was being so thorough and generous. And I I really, you know, I'm again, like quite careful about what I'm eating and aware of what I'm putting in my body, I think. And and yet I had massively underestimated, I think, by the, the percentages in the story, but it was like. 30% 30% or something like I really underestimated um, my calorie consumption because based on basically what I reported, it would be impossible for me to maintain my current body size if that's really what I was eating. That's fascinating. And so I think the lesson there is like, like, uh, yeah, exercise, fantastic for health, exercise as much as your time allows. And um, you'll, you'll reap so many rewards, including you know, potentially even a longer life. Like it basically doesn't get any better than that. But I think sometimes in our quest for this like magic solution or this one simple answer, we we overlook, you know, the, the salad dressing we put on our salad at lunch and, you know, all these little things that add up in a day to to many, many calories that um, that, yeah, we're not even aware we're eating that might be making losing weight or maintaining our weight much harder than we'd like. Because so, when you were in that chamber, you were able to find out basically how many calories you were burning through just sitting, resting, your normal sleep patterns, um, working on a computer, et cetera, which we all have a fantasy about, I think, inaccurately, as you say. And similarly, we have a fantasy about how many calories we take in to offset all those those changes. Right, exactly. Yeah. And and um, yeah, so they, so they were able to measure that and it looked like... Uh, yeah, I got this very precise reading on how much I'm burning and they also feed you three meals while you're in the chamber and they know exactly, um, yeah, they, they, (laughs) they measure it down to the gram and then you have to send through the chamber wall, anything you don't eat, (laughs) which they then record to, to get this precise measurement of your calorie consumption. So I had a pretty, yeah, good sense. And I was surprised by, yeah, how much we we sometimes we might um, we might underestimate what we're putting in our bodies. Did you smuggle um, anything in just in case for the? You know, I was surprised I could have. I realized they they say don't bring any food in, and I, actually, I should say they 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 also watch you through. So you there's like a plexiglass window in the chamber, and they watch you through that and check in on you. And then there there's also a video camera in the corner of the chamber. So. Um, they're watching you through that as well. And I'm sure if I was like eating chocolate bars, they would have, they would have discounted me as a research eh, participant. Eh, eh. I, yeah, I got I got in trouble when I wasn't resting enough. Like you have these rest periods where they want to see what's happening with your metabolism at rest. And I definitely, um, sometimes I was too jittery. I wasn't resting enough and I got scolded. So <laughs> last, anyway. last question. How did that experience and like that, like you discovered you're, you were eating more probably than you ex- thought you were. Did it change you in any way in terms of your behavior? Did you find yourself, how long ago was it and, and what's happened since then? Anything noticeable besides you got a very nice article about it, which we'll link to. Yeah, I, I think, I don't know if I changed my behavior. I think like the, now my health routines are like pretty set, set in and. Uh, but I, I, again, it did make me think about how there there was a a big gap between the reports I was getting about my health and sometimes how I feel about you know my health. Like, and it, it did make me think about all this m- messaging in our society from like yeah the Dr. Oz's and the Gwyneth Paltrow's and the gym conglomerates and the the healthy food purveyors and the water um, industry. The water, yes, big water and big blueberry and um, all these, yeah, co- we're constantly bombarded with messages about how to, you know, how we could be a little bit healthier and um, how we should be doing X or Y. And and I guess, yeah, I, I, it made me a little bit more aware of how much those messages might affect you. And even if you are a critical thinking, you know, informed person about these issues, um, somehow, yeah, they, they can affect you and shape how you think about yourself. And so I guess that that's the one thing that, that, um, that, and, and thinking a little more about maybe sometimes that I'm, you know, underestimating my calorie consumption. So what, what I'm eating a little bit more that maybe sometimes I'm, I'm underestimating it. 
And um, it also gave me like a, a whole new appreciation for the research they're doing at at um, at NIH and and how difficult it is to going back to our first conversation how difficult it is to to do this kind of research. My guest today has been Julia Bellus. Julia, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks so much. Great to talk to you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.